Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, week's uh, annual uh, weekly colloquium of the CT.AI Digital Transformation Institute. Uh, it's our great pleasure to welcome you to the third of this series. And let me just tell you a little bit about the Institute. The Institute was, uh, the Institute's mission is to attract the world's leading scientists to use uh, a combination of the newest advances in AI and IoT uh, to put together a uh, research agenda for the digital transformation of business, government, and society. Uh, it has as partners, the first of all, the sponsors are C3.ai and Microsoft. And as university partners, we have uh, Illinois and Berkeley as the co-leads, Carnegie Mellon, MIT, Princeton, and the University of Chicago and Stanford University two national labs, the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs and the National Center for Superconducting Applications at the University of Illinois are also partners in this institute. Uh, we've had uh, two wonderful talks and uh, one today in terms of uh, the economics of, uh, of optimally uh, making targeted closures of the uh, economy while maintaining our uh, public health standards is the title of today's talk. But I want to take this chance to give you a sense that Professor Burge's talk, which you'll, I'm going to introduce Professor Burge in a second, is going to be the first in a sort of a theme of talks, which will focus on, uh, you know, a really an engaging problem of the day. It is about how do you reopen an economy that has been so to sort of drastically shut down and with very little planning while maintaining a grip on this pandemic. So to that end, we'll have next week a team from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, Tamir Bashar, Carolyn Beck, and Rebecca Smith, and they'll talk about what are, some, what are the tools that are needed for doing this monitoring and the algorithms. So that'll be a treat. And then Professor Daron Ajemolu from MIT on August 6th, We'll talk about the theory also related to today's talk of optimal targeted lockdowns in a multi-group SIR, of course, the susceptible infected recovered models of the pandemic. Uh, Dimitri Bertsimas, also from MIT, will talk about his uh, new website about how do you get analytics on clinical and policy decision support for the pandemic. From public health, Stefano Bertozzi and a set of his colleagues will talk about the special problems for data of using data science to record uh, transmission in Latin America and especially in Mexico. The last talk for August will be uh, Azul Dagla, and she too will talk about targeted interventions. And of course, you can see that it also has connections with today's uh, talk. We actually have a full schedule for the rest of the semester as well. We don't uh, just, but looking ahead, uh, Zoe Rapti will talk about, uh, you know, how do hotspots show up and how do you sort of uh, think about the propagation. So those are two modeling talks, Zoe Rapti and Red Spore from Princeton, Zoe Rapti from the University of Illinois. And Sandra Bameen will return to the theme of reopening, but the focus on urban mobility. You know, how do you open subway lines, bus lines, and what is the role of the role of contact tracing, privacy issues, all of that. So that and the San Mikoyejo from the University of Illinois, Sarab from MIT. San Mikoyejo will talk about how do different medical establishments, hospitals, in a secure way share uh, clinical information so as to do distributed search. And finally, Cynthia Mulainathan, also from the University of Chicago, and Zia Dobermeyer of Berkeley will talk about using machine learning on, uh, on x-rays, CD scans, and other, uh, other image data to do a triage of pulmonary collapse. So we, you know, it's an exciting series. Uh, uh, we look forward to it. Let me just, uh, before I turn the floor over to today's speaker, let me say a few words. You know, he's a very distinguished speaker. He is the, he holds the Hobart Williams chair of operations uh, management at the University of Chicago Booth School. And, uh, he, he, you know, he, this is right up his alley, mathematical model of systems under uncertainty with applications to energy, finance, healthcare, and manufacturing. 
and of course, public policy. You know, I think the scientists of America have a lot to offer public policy and uh, elected officials in this talk, today's talk will not disappoint you. He's an informed fellow, he's a distinguished fellow of the uh, Management Sciences uh, Society, and he's a member of the National Academy of Engineers. He's currently the lead ed editor-in-chief of Operations Research. Uh, Dean of Engineering at Northwestern before he moved to Chicago, and he's been the chair of uh, Industrial Engineering and Operations Research at the University of Michigan. His degrees are from uh, Princeton and MS and PhD from Stanford. I should say all, all those institutions are CDTI partners. So without further ado, let me uh, present to you Professor Birch and thank you so much for speaking today. Please, Professor Birch. Thank you, Shankar. Let me get Please my... take over the screen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, let me get my screen. Uh, oh, I have one more slide. I think a uh, 40-minute presentation, Q&A, please use the Q&A feature. Camille will remind you about using the Q&A feature, upload questions, and I'm going to try to cover as many as we can after the talk. Okay, over to you. Okay, let me get my screen up. Yes, okay. And yeah. Okay, so, uh, well, thank you, Shankar. Thank you for inviting me to give this talk to the CTI, CDTI colloquium. Uh, this is joint work that I've done with my colleague, Ozan Jandwan, um, also at Booth, and Yiding Feng, who's in computer science at Northwestern. Um, and the point of our work is to look at what other kinds of approaches could we, could we follow in trying to combat the spread of COVID-19 or in general combat epidemic spreads and to be able to do it in better ways to reduce economic loss. And in general, what we wanna do um, is to do this in ways that target where some kind of restrictions, some kind of economic uh, change in activity um, is to the most benefit in terms of uh, reducing infections and um, but still allowing as many people as possible to work. Um, so that's kind of the overview of what we'll talk about. Um, so these kinds of restrictions, we think of those as, as non-pharmaceutical interventions. These are interventions um, such as lockdowns. Um, they're often quite blunt, uh, that, that is, that will close an entire class of business um, throughout a state or throughout a city. Uh, and they result in certainly great economic costs, as we've seen um, unemployment increasing greatly, uh, GDP going down. Um, but associated with that are also healthcare costs. So they're certainly substantial costs for people who are unemployed. Um, and shutting down of the economy also leads people not to seek healthcare. Um, so there, there are other kinds of costs that go along uh, with these kinds of non-pharmaceutical interventions. Um, and what we want to look at in particular is what's the impact of the fact that we've seen a lot of heterogeneity in terms of how this disease spreads um, in different countries and different places within a country and even different neighborhoods within a given city. Um, I think you know, recently, for example, uh, neighborhoods in Houston, one neighborhood has lots of cases, uh, uh, the neighborhood right next to it doesn't have very many at all. Uh, so it seems like looking at it from the perspective of different geographies actually is an important consideration in thinking about how we might deal uh, with these kinds of epidemics. 
Um, and so we want to, in particular, think about those places where there might be um, increasing spread from uh, the disease. Okay, so these are the questions we want to answer. Uh, how much can we gain by restricting economic activity in different neighborhoods? So we'll look at it from the neighborhood perspective and trying to say, well, if we could do it neighborhood by neighborhood, how much would we be able to save in terms of economic costs while still ensuring that the disease doesn't spread? And therefore, which locations should we try to target? How much does it depend on what's happening outside that given area? So if I'm in New York City, how much am I impacted by, let's say, New Jersey or Connecticut or upstate New York? And uh, how much do you gain by trying to target relative to having a policy that just is uniform, goes across an entire region, an entire city or entire state. Uh, I'll just give you a brief overview of uh, what we're going to find. Um, but what we do is we come up with a framework that looks at these targeted closures. It includes how people move about among those neighborhoods, how they would generally move without any kind of interventions. And it includes heterogeneity in terms of how much economic value is being generated in the different neighborhoods, as well as how much infection is already present in those different neighborhoods. So we're gonna consider all those things within our study. And we come up with an optimization formulation that fits what we call either a large infection regime or a small infection regime. So basically the large infection regime refers to a time when the disease is already spreading, there's already community spread of the disease, um, and perhaps it is overwhelming uh, the healthcare system, or at least reaching, let's say, a state of um, capacity of the healthcare system. Uh, so we call that the large infection regime. And then a small infection regime where we don't have any outbreaks, uh, but we'd like to be able to ensure that any outbreak that does occur uh, does not lead to uh, epidemic spread. And uh, we'll apply this to New York City. Um, what's interesting is when we apply to New York City, we see that there are different areas that we would like to remain open in particular, Midtown Manhattan. And we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about why Mid Midtown Manhattan. Um, and by doing this, we could have something on the order of four to six times as much employment as a policy that does this, has the same objective in terms of not increasing infections in any neighborhood, uh, but that has a uniform policy throughout the city. Uh, so by targeting, we can actually save a, a considerable amount. Um, and the other point that I'm going to bring up as I get into uh, the data is that it's critical for some kind of coordination with neighboring counties um, in order for uh, a given location, in this case, New York City, uh, in order for them to be able to control uh, what's happening uh, with the disease. Okay, so I'm not going to uh, go into all of the literature. Um, as you know, if you've been following any of this, it's just been exploding um, over the past uh, few months. Um, I think you're gonna hear about this work by Ajmal um, uh, shortly uh, in the seminar series, um, but there's been a lot in terms of uh, how COVID-19 is spreading, in terms of what is the economic impact of COVID-19, in terms of how people move about, what kinds of population flows there are, how that affects epidemics, um, and then uh, different uh, papers that people have talked about, similar to ours in terms of what 
types of controls um, might be used um, for dealing with epidemics. Okay, so here's, here's our basic model. Um, and Shankar referred to the SIR model. We add one additional compartment to that, which we call expose. Um, so we have a city that's divided into different neighborhoods. So the neighborhoods are I, and the set of all the neighborhoods is this uh, set here, V. Uh, the population in each neighborhood is, let's say, N for every neighborhood I. Uh, so within each of these neighborhoods, we'll assume that there's a certain number of people who are susceptible. And if they are exposed in um, a way which I'll, I'll make concrete in a minute, um, then they go into the exposed state. Now the exposed state is someone who has actually contracted the virus, um, but we don't know if, if they're going to have symptoms or not yet, but, they, but the virus is, has entered them and now uh, it's either going to progress into a disease or not. Now the way we're, we're gonna model that here is to say uh, that there's a certain fraction who are going to become what we'll call clinical. That's what the C there is on this uh, capital I. Uh, so the clinicals are those that we think are actually manifesting symptoms and are the people that, uh, at least at the early stages of the disease, which um, let's say in March and April, um, those are the people that would be tested and uh, that you would see as, as uh, reported cases. And then the subclinical, um, these would be people who are asymptomatic or people who have very mild symptoms, um, not enough that, uh, for example, they would seek medical treatment um, or at that time that they would be tested. Um, so we're assuming that those are not uh, people that are not being tested. And then they'll go into this recovered group after um, recovering from the disease. Uh, now uh, we can include uh, death as also a, a an additional outcome, but for the purpose of our model, we'll just assume everyone is going to recover and they go into this um, uh, recovered group for each of the different neighborhoods. Now there are certain parameters, which I'll talk about. Uh, the first of which is the transmission rate, which is basically saying, how likely are you to become exposed? In other words, to actually get the virus um, given that there's a certain fraction of people around you who are infected. Um, and we have two uh, forms of that. So th this is for people that this beta up here is actually for people who are infected and are clinical. And then alpha times beta is for people who are affected but are subclinical. So we're assuming that there could be two different rates, which it appears uh, that there are, at least from the data that we've seen. Uh, so that's a discount. So we'll assume that alpha is something that's going to be at most one, um, and it's going to discount how likely you are to become exposed to the, disease, to the disease, given a number of people who are infected around you. Um, and then uh, the rate at which uh, people are going to become infected from being exposed, that's given here by kappa. And then the fraction that become clinical is rho. The subclinical would be one minus that. Um, and then the time to recovery is here given by uh, gamma. We assume that there is some uh, natural population change, but for the time period that we're looking at, we'll just assume that uh, the natural death rate is zero so that uh, everyone is uh, going to be maintained or the populations are gonna be maintained throughout the period that we'll look at, which um, could be quite short. Okay, so um, as I said, we want to have how population flows are occurring um, from one neighborhood to another. So we're going to have to look at how many people are going from one neighborhood to another. And the way we'll do that is by coming up with how much time each individual that goes that lives in neighborhood I, how much time do they spend in a different neighborhood J? So this tau IJ is the fraction of their time that an individual from neighborhood I on average spends in neighborhood J. And now this is outside of their home. 
So one minus the sum of all the times that they spend outside their home in either their own neighborhood or different neighborhoods, uh, that is going to be the time that they spend at home. Um, now the infections are going to be driven by how many people there are, how many people are susceptible, um, and how many, how many people are infected that they come into contact with or could come into contact with. And so that's, that's gonna be given here by SI prime. So this would be like SI after new infections occur. And it's gonna be, well, there's, I mean, there's some population change, um, but for us, that's gonna be zero. And now some people have become infected. So that means that the susceptible is going down. That infection rate again is this beta. Um, and what it's proportional to is how much time, if you're in neighborhood I, how much time you spend in each of the other neighborhoods and what fraction of that population is infected. And that's what's given by this, uh, these parameters here that are, or this term here that is in red. And as you see, there's this, this discounting here that goes in for the subclinical part. Okay, so this is kind of the key key part. So this is the, the susceptible in say the next period is going to be, um, well, the change in susceptibles in the next period is going to be however many people now have been infected. So then this, this is going to be the number of people that are going to be infected. So it's the change in the susceptibility. Um, okay, so this, this term that's down here, this is, this is effectively how many people are in J and, and uh, moving about in J. Um, and so this ratio here, again, is that that's the total number that's um, infected. And as I mentioned, this was discounting for those that are subclinical. Okay, now the, the control that we're going to imply, that we're going to apply is that we can restrict activity in um, a given neighborhood and we're going to indicate that here by X. So if XI is equal to one, that means that we're allowing all activity. If XI is going to be equal to zero, that means we're not um, allowing um, any activity um, uh, at all. Um, so our, our uh, disease now is gonna be affected by, by this X. So if we, if we allow it completely, then we'll get the full effect of the spread of the disease. So if X, XJ here is equal to one, um, then we'll get exactly what we would have without any control whatsoever. However, if we can put X day, XJ down to zero, then what's that saying is I've restricted all of the activity that's in neighborhood J and I'm assuming then um, that Proportionally, people are not going to be coming to neighborhood J. Uh, so the effect in terms of infections from that neighborhood is proportionally going to lower with XJ. Now the cost of doing this, if I shut things down, the cost of doing it is whatever the economic value is in neighborhood I, um, which is here given by C with the subscript I, and then however much is shut down, which is one minus XI. So that's the total cost. Um, and what we're gonna use for this CI is going to be the total employment. So what we want is to keep people as employed as possible um, as, we, as we start to impose these controls. Okay, so the system looks like this. This is, this is how much S is changing from one period to the next. And uh, it's dependent on these controls that are going to be applied. This is what's happening to the exposed portion. And then from the exposed portion, they're going in uh, to either being clinical or subclinical. And then from that, they're going in um, to being recovered. And what we wanna do is to choose our X's in the best possible way. So that's our, that's our goal in terms of policy. Well, what's the best possible way um, what we want is to impose some kind of restriction on what will happen in terms of 
overall infections. So that will be the number of people that get exposed, the number who are newly clinical, newly subclinical. What we would like is that all of these are less than or equal to zero. That will ensure that in every neighborhood within this location, within the city, um, that within every neighborhood, uh, the infections are going to go down. Um, so if, if hospitals were already at capacity, this would ensure that we don't go beyond capacity, assuming that we need new infections um, in order to increase uh, the load on the hospitals. Um, and what we'll do then is to do that in such a way that we maintain as much economic activity as possible or minimize the cost of the activity that we're going to close. So that's maximizing our index of activity within each of the neighborhoods times how much we keep those neighborhoods open. And then this constraint is just the, the, this constraint up here. It's just saying that we want to ensure that uh, all of the neighborhoods are seeing decreases in the total populations who um, have either newly exposed or, or newly getting infected. Okay, so it relies on all these disease states. We need to, we need to know what state the system is in um, and we could then apply this dynamically. So we could say, okay, well, let's observe how many people are susceptible, exposed, uh, let's say clinical and subclinical in each of the neighborhoods. Um, and then we could say, well, how, many, how much are we going to leave open or close? Um, we could apply that for some time and then update how many people now are susceptible, exposed, et cetera, um, with new information and then uh, use that. Okay, so um, that's our large infection regime. Now, when, I, when we talk about a small infection regime, that's a situation where effectively the disease is either dormant or it hasn't uh, progressed um, and we want to prevent it. Maybe uh, we've seen in a, a handful of infections, we wanna prevent the epidemic from spreading. Um, what would we do in order um, to stop it? Um, and uh, that requires that we look at the overall progress of the disease throughout the entire region. And if it was, if it was a, a single region, then this would be the sort of well-known reproductive number R0 um, or R0, um, which is basically how many people um, can an infected person infect on average. Um, if that's less than one, then the, the disease basically will die out. Um, so what we would like to do is to have um, equivalently something like that R0 being uh, less than one. And that will be uh, a stable equilibrium that will just end up with uh, no one, if, if we were able to maintain that, um, we, we would end up with uh, the epidemic not starting. And um, that turns out to be equivalent to a, a matrix inequality here, where this is a matrix that's composed of the time that people spend in different areas, um, the uh, restrictions that are, that are placed on them, um, another diagonal matrix for how long they're spending in these different areas, um, and relating that to the population and then the, the parameters. And basically it says that this matrix is less in terms of uh, the positive semi, semi definite ordering than this matrix over here. Um, or that if I take this and subtract this matrix, it's positive definite. Um, so that's, that's the condition um, that uh, this X would have to satisfy in order to ensure that basically, um, the no infection equilibrium is stable. And to achieve that, then what we would want to do is the same thing. 
we would maximize the amount of activity that we can allow um, subject to the constraint that, um, well, that, the, that matrix, um, which is this, what's on the right-hand side here minus left-hand side is, is positive semi-definite. Um, we want to uh, solve then this. This is a, a semi-definite programming problem, which is um, something like a linear, pro the, the first um, large regime was just a linear program. This is something like a linear program, except it's, it's linear in a matrix. So it's this matrix X that's in here um, that um, we have to deal with. But it, it's the same kind of constraint, a non-negativity or cone constraint um, as you might have in a linear program. Okay, so um, we have these two problems, P1, which was the large infection, P2, which is the small infection. And we're going to determine what these optimal values are. What we need in order to do that are these, whatever the, op whatever the economic value is for activity in each of the different neighborhoods, um, what the flows are between those neighborhoods. And um, particularly for that, well, essentially only for that uh, large infection problem, what the state of the disease is at uh, the current time. Um, now we're going to compare this to saying, well, what if we do the same thing to every neighborhood? So maybe it's, maybe it's unfair that some neighborhoods are targeted differently um, from others, in which case we would impose a constraint that all the neighborhoods have to have the same effective closure, um, so, or the same effective opening. Um, so we'll put in a constraint that says they, they have to be the same across all the different neighborhoods. Then we'll look at what's the difference. How much do we lose by imposing this kind of uh, uniformity or fairness constraint? We're going to use uh, New York City data, as I mentioned. Um, we'll use, uh, I have a little bit older data on the slides here than maybe the latest, but at, at the time we were first writing the paper, I'll put in the, what best estimates there were for parameters from COVID-19 um, in New York City. Um, I'll have New York City infection numbers for a given, at a given time period. I'll have uh, data on mobility, this mobile phone data, which is tracked at the census block level. Um, and then I'll use the US Census for uh, what the employment is. And we'll, we'll just use employment as our measure of the economic activity. Um, we'll use these zip code tabulation areas of uh, New York City, which are essentially like zip codes, um, but they'll be like the, uh, our basic block. Um, you can think of zip code tabulation areas as being somewhere between a census block and a census block group. So a lot of things are reported at census block group level. Um, these zip code tabulation areas are somewhere between that and, and the, the census block. Okay, so these are, are the neighborhoods. This is just looking at populations. Um, so uh, populations here, uh, which are relatively light for a zip code tabulation area are the darker ones down here. Um, whereas the lighter ones for zip code tabulation are the uh, lighter ones in this diagram. Um, there are many people um, who also come into New York. So um, we include in addition to all the zip code tabulation areas in New York, we're going to include uh, the 10 counties that send the most people into New York on a given day. Um, so we'll include 10 counties in addition to all the zip code tabulation areas, about 225 um, different neighborhoods in this case. Um, as I said, we have this mobility data. It includes um, about 10% of all the, all the devices um, in each of the neighborhoods. It has identified um, effectively where everyone lives and how much time they spend at home. And then it has a number of visits that they make at different places. And we're gonna scale those number of visits to come up with 
the time that they spend in uh, these different neighborhoods, which is effectively saying that all the vis visits have the same weight. Um, and we're going to calibrate it using the data before there was any kind of interventions. So we'll, we'll take it from January until the end of February. And, um, you know, we look at different windows, but it doesn't seem to make too much difference. Um, these are the estimates for the parameters. As I said, uh, we have some different estimates now based on later findings, but basically these are the infection rates, how quickly people are uh, clearing, um, or how people are, how quickly people are getting infected, what fraction are being clinical, um, what the discount is. This is alpha is the discount for those that are subclinical, and this is how long people are with the disease or in the infected state. Um, and uh, here's what the city looks like um, at the time that we're going to uh, use as our example. So we'll start at sort of the height of infections in New York, which is around April 18th. And um, you can see there, the lighter areas are the ones that have um, more infections. Uh, the darker areas um, have uh, fewer infections. Um, and we can also look at economic activity. So here's a measure of uh, economic activity relative um, to a norm. So the lighter here would be that um, there's a lot more activity than people that live, live there. Um, and uh, you can see that this is Manhattan. So this is Midtown Manhattan, um, which seems to be, that's obviously a high economic activity area. Um, and that's going to be something that we'll, we'll see come up in this, these solutions. Uh, so we'll look at targeted closures in New York. Um, now we have to make some assumption about what happens outside. What we're going to assume is that all of those other counties follow a similar policy, um, but ju just to make it um, so we can make it more tractable. Um, so we'll assume that all of them follow some policy that's given. That is, they have a fraction of Y open. Um, so Y is the amount that they keep open. Um, and then we'll look at what does, uh, um, what does New York do? What, what do we do in the neighborhoods within New York, given that those are kind of fixed? And we'll look at some, some measures of efficiency that go along with this. Okay, so, um, so measure of efficiency is basically how much what fraction of the total economic activity um, are you allowed to be open? And what we see up here, this in this corner, this is saying suppose that all the other counties actually lock down en entirely. And then um, what would we do in New York City in terms of uh, the dark would be um, where things are basically shut down. Um, uh, the light is where things are open. And what you'll notice is that it, uh, although there's, there's a lot of closures down here in the southern tip of North Manhattan where Wall Street is, um, we'll see openings here in um, the middle of Midtown. Um, so where there's a lot of economic activity, um, uh, we see um, that we have openings there and then we'll have some closures like here in Queens. Um, that uh, where areas that uh, if we were, were to let them uh, be open, um, they, they would have more spread of the disease. Um, so what you notice here is that as I increase economic activity in these neighboring counties, the efficiency that's possible in New York goes down. So I go from zero to 0.4, and the efficiency goes down now to 0.45, if I go up to 0.8, it goes down to 4, 0.4. And then if I go all the way to 1, that is no controls outside New York, um, it falls um, to 0.37. Uh, um, so again, these, uh, there's a difference because of those, uh, what's happening in those other locations. Um, this is a comparison of the, the value of targeting. This is the efficiency if uh, this is how much I'm able to, to keep open 
if I follow this targeted regime. And what's here in red is following a uniform regime. As you can see, there's, there's a large difference in terms of what that efficiency gain is. Um, so we get a great deal of uh, gain and efficiency um, by uh, moving to targeting. And I'll show the, uh, this ratio. So this is the ratio. Um, so as uh, we allow more and more to go on in uh, the neighboring counties, that ratio increases and it goes, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, it goes from somewhere around four, so you're getting four times as much economic activity as with a uniform policy, um, to something like six, uh, depending on how much you allow in uh, those uh, neighboring counties. So the, uh, yeah, so targeting actually can achieve this goal, um, four to six times more employment than um, using the uniform policies. Um, here, this is uh, repeating the exercise with uh, the small infection regime. As you notice, there's a lot more efficiency that can be gained. Um, see a lot more white on uh, these diagrams relative to the others. Even uh, this is in the case when everyone, uh, there's no work outside. However, if you allow, um, if, you, if you allow the neighboring counties to resume normal economic activity, uh, then there's no longer uh, the ability um, that there, there's nothing that New York City would be able to do um, to contain, contain the disease. That is that um, the infection would spread. We wouldn't be able to have that effective reproductive reproductive number be less than one um, if we allow everything to, uh, to, to um, increase outside New York. Um, and this is, this is just showing what's the, the, the fraction uh, that you can allow um, in different, different cases when we, we think about it. Um, this is the ratio between uh, our targeted policy versus the uniform policy, um, because even in, in this case, uh, uniform policy does allow uh, for a significant opening. Um, the difference is not as significant as it is in a large um, regime, um, but there's still a difference. So uh, targeting, definitely you can get greater efficiency than you can um, by having a uniform policy. Um, it's somewhere uh, greater than 10%, um, but it could be, uh, depending on, again, what's happening at, in the outside counties, um, it could get up to something like uh, one and a quarter percent or 1.2 percent or 25 uh, percent um, or 1.2 times um, what you would have in the uniform policy. Uh, this is just trying to understand a little bit about uh, what's going on. We look at the uh, a ratio of uh, people that come into a neighborhood relative to the economic activity in that neighborhood. And here, um, if that ratio is uh, closer to zero, that means that it's a, it's a neighborhood with very high activity or, uh, or with very few people. Uh, that come into it, um, but you can see that uh, man, uh, Midtown Manhattan has uh, very high activity and that's um, a reason for looking at Midtown Manhattan. Um, this is uh, looking a little bit more um, at that uh, economic activity. Um, the correlation between the two in terms of uh, what our optimal policy was and this uh, uh, ratio of inflow to economic activity, um, that correlation is highly negative as, as you can sort of tell by the colors. Um, and that's saying that, yeah, uh, areas in which you have um, a, a lot of uh, activity in terms of um, employment um, but maybe a lot of people who actually just live there and, and are working there, um, that that's an, that's an area that you would want to uh, keep open. 
So uh, to conclude, um, what we've given is a framework for studying these target closures. Um, we've taken advantage of this data that we were uh, able to have from SafeGraph on these movements of people from one location to another. So we know how people are traveling um, throughout the region. Um, it depends a lot on this heterogeneity in terms of how much employment there are in different areas and what the infection rates are in those different areas. Um, and by using optimization, both in the sort of the preventive phase, that small infection kind of regime or in um, a situation where we're just trying to, to uh, maintain stability, say the healthcare system in the large infection regime, um, we're able to use optimization. Um, and uh, with our application in New York, we looked and saw um, how it has some implications in terms of economic activity in Midtown um, versus elsewhere. And um, that uh, the targeting in our examples um, with in the large infection regime was something like four to six times, uh, allows for four to six times more employment. Um, but coordination with neighbors is um, quite critical. So I think I'll stop there and we'll open it up uh, for questions. So I see a question on the uh, Q&A. So how do rates of infection or even perception of those rates affect movement across neighborhoods and social distancing? Yeah. Uh, sorry, John, I was uh, yeah. muted. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so the first question was about sort of behavioral in terms of the model. Uh, you know, how does, uh, how does the perception of the rates affect movement across neighborhoods? Uh, that was, uh, I think it was an early question during your talk. Right, yeah. Now, I, I will say in, in the model that I just presented, we didn't include these behaviors that, um, that if, we, if we think that there's high infection in a given area that people are gonna stay away from it. Uh, we developed a model that kind of builds on that and says, okay, there's gonna be a certain fraction that are, there's uh, a certain fraction basically is afraid of going to a, a given region. Um, so it's something that can be built into the model. Um, the results I showed you didn't have that yet, but that is something that, um, that we're putting in. Okay, uh, question from Victoria. Uh, the framework looks uh, like it will allow better off areas to continue to run uh, because they have greater economic activity, but force areas with lower socioeconomic benefit to, uh, you know, to cooperate. And so the question is about if you're a policymaker, how do you contend with disparity given by the optimization? Yeah, so, uh, so the question is whether, I guess you have to think about, um, you know, did, do you want to keep, where do you want to keep people employed? Um, and I think that's, that's something for people to think about. And uh, now it doesn't necessarily, um, it doesn't, this model doesn't necessarily favor um, neighborhoods that just happen to have um, a lot of employment. If, if you had a lot of employment, but, um, you also have a lot of people who are in that neighborhood who uh, might become infected, um, then uh, you would still not want um, to open that, that neighborhood. So it's, it's more about how, how much you can infect um, other people uh, based on the economic activity that's happening there. Um, but, uh, yeah, but it, it does bring up wh whether, uh, it 
brings up questions. I mean, this is all about employment. So, um, you know, it, it might be better for certain neighborhoods to be closed, but for employment to happen in other neighborhoods, um, because m the majority of people living in that neighborhood actually work in those other neighborhoods. And so um, for them to be able um, to sustain um, um, employment, um, you know, because employment actually has a, has a big health consequence that mortality goes up about 60% with unemployment. Um, so just the mortality from unemployment it's probably going to be pretty significant. I think there's already some data that suggests that. Uh, the next question, fantastic. Uh, you know, I've got all kinds of questions. I'm going to hold back in the interest of. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Marcus uh, wants to know what role do you see for AI platforms? Uh, maybe this about how do you identify the parameters, uh, learning. How do you make meaningful recommendations? Uh, and the other one is uh, now that you're in the midst of a search, I'm sort of interpreting. What, what sorts of recommendations would you make? Uh, lots of people seem to be uh, upvoted this question, so. Yeah, so I think, um, uh, well, first in terms of the AI, um, yeah, so I, th I think AI could be most valuable in uh, trying to identify these parameters. Um, and that's something else that, uh, that we've been working on um, lately. Um, so I think, and, and in terms of um, trying to update them, because we, you know, we're, I think we're learning more about uh, this disease kind of every day. Um, so being able to update uh, those parameters very quickly using information um, that's available, I think that's, that's kind of um, critical. Um, so the, the way I think to implement this um, is to think about the types of businesses um, businesses in which people can stay distant from one another, um, have large space, um, those might be at uh, one end of the spectrum of uh, businesses that you might want to close. Businesses that are very uh, contained, um, like restaurants, which pe people have used, or restaurants and bars, um, and uh, have closed space, um, those might be at the other end. Um, so coming up with some kind of hierarchy um, and doing it, um, but you can do it by location or um, you can impose different restrictions on people who go in to, uh, or, or on, for people to open in different locations. Um, and that could be part of this, uh, the targeting as well. Uh, let me amplify that. There's a question from Jippy Gutierrez which says, what does the model in, uh, assume in terms of public transport? But one question that could be added on to this is, I mean, if it was New York City data and, you know, the exiles who had all the, uh, all the economic activity, so would you choose to use uh, transportation as an economic lever? And the questions about, uh, I think our colleague Saurabh Amin, he didn't put up his question, but he's wanted to ask, how do you use the public transportation levers to 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 influence the excise? I guess. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so public transportation is actually something, um, particularly uh, my colleague Ozan was uh, interested in um, from the very beginning, um, because we didn't have uh, we didn't include that directly in this model because we didn't have that data. Um, we're now looking at data actually from the Bay Area um, uh, because we have a little bit, a little bit better transportation data we think um, that's available there. Um, and uh, but yeah, so certainly public public transit. Um, I, I think a we need to understand what the role is of public transit, and we think it could be significant, particularly in New York City. It seems to have been. Um, and uh, then uh, think about how, uh, um, how we might be able to implement this. It's not completely obvious. I don't know if you, if you have looked at the data, um, but basically um, something like, you know, BART. Um, and so ridership and BART went down, you know, sort of precipitously, um, but uh, like ridership on Muni in San Francisco uh, didn't. 
Um, so uh, that suggests that different modes of transportation actually um, are taken by people that are in uh, different employment categories. And, um, and so you have, to, you have to really consider about how, how people use public transit and, uh, you know, and uh, whether those people, I also didn't talk about uh, jobs that can basically be, be done online um, versus jobs that can't be done online. That's another thing that we would need to, uh, um, to really look at this in, in great detail, which we're trying to understand um, using data from uh, the Bay Area. Yeah, that was the follow-up from Victoria about uh, you know, taking into account jobs that can be done. Uh, uh, oh, know, easily from home, yeah. So that's uh, another thing. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, so you answered that question. Uh, there's another question from Shailar D. I think that's uh, uh, the person from MIT. Uh, how often do recommended target closures change? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I think that's an, that's, that's an interesting question. I think, you know, you, you have to maintain the, the policies for um, a given number of, uh, I mean, for least at uh, least a week, maybe a month, um, you know, just to give people uh, some time to be able to uh, um, inform their employees, um, infl inform their customers. Um, so uh, yeah, I think it has to be done. It can't be done, you know, on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, I know um, it's driving businesses back in here in California to be yeah, asked to, to, open to close them and, and then open them. Yeah. Um, you know, hopefully. Um, the, you know, the way it should progress is you would start with a certain number of closures and then you open and keep on opening and you wouldn't have to go back the other direction. Um, so that would be the, so the point would be you want to keep it long enough um, that you're consistent like that, that, uh, you know, once you open a business that there's low likelihood that you're going to uh, have to close it again. Okay, uh, a somewhat political question from Shitage. He's one of mine, so I can say that. So he said, how do you incorporate uh, what you hear on the radio or on the television every day that infections and economic rates are actually related? A healthy society is an economically functioning society. Is there a way to incorporate economic models of growth and activity endogenously into the SEIR models? That's the question. Uh, well, I, 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 I think, uh, you mean how, how does and it... He wants to, if, if the population feels that, uh, you know, the rates are decreasing, it's a stimulant for activity, or, you know, because you, you were comparing it to the pre, uh, pre-pandemic levels of economic activity for the efficiency. And so he's trying to say, how do you, can you build in one where, one of the things you do is you spur the economy by making it seem healthy. Oh, by oh, by making it seem healthy. Yeah. So, I, I, well, I, I think there's a little bit of a. I mean, that there's a little bit of a conflict, and you know, when when you limit economic activity, you're also going to damage health. Um, and so, uh, there's a question about how much. Uh, uh, yeah. How how do you, uh, you know, you can think of it as balancing health and health. Um, I, I sort of think of it more in terms of health um, and yeah, economic activities related to health. Um, but that's, you know, that, those are broader questions in terms of health. Yeah. It's not just health with respect to one disease. Um, and so, I, yeah, I mean, I think from a, a social perspective, we should think about the entire health of the population. Um, you know, not just, we, we don't just protect against one disease at, at a time um, because there are a lot of diseases. So a lot of uh, health concerns. Um, John, I think we are at the end of the hour. A gentleman asked if he might have the slides. I just announced on the call, we'll talk to Professor Burge and we'll see what he'd like to do. And then oh, sure. uh, the talk yeah. has been recorded. It'll be on the website. And please join me even virtually in thanking John for really uh, 
opening up a fantastic area of research and really just wonderful analysis. Congratulations. Well, thank, thank you. Very thank much. you, Shankar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. One more question. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Bye. Oh, another question. No, no, it's okay. I think we'll. Thank you all very much. All right. Bye -bye. Thank you.